very warm welcome to everybody for the 19th meetup of the Blockchain Hub Cross. And uh, so as, as a lot of you already know, this is kind of a tradition here, uh, having a monthly uh, kind of meetup uh, talking about blockchain related topics. Um, and uh, I will give a short intro and then we will go to our main act uh, talking about smart contracts on Ethereum uh, and give you a better info on this one. So, um, but before I jump into, uh, I would like to say Lab 10 Collective is. Uh, Lab 10 Collective is, is the sponsor here. So, if you're intending to sponsor this kind of event, we can really do, re reduce it by the bracket. So, I don't know the English term for it. Uh, so, uh, to have more sponsors on this one, and, uh, and because sponsors get some extra air time, uh, we also have uh, here a uh, uh, job posting to mention, uh, because uh, we are looking basically for development members or new members which are going into development. Uh, we have a couple, of, uh, a couple of things what we are looking people for. And uh, we have also some description, it's also back there on the wall. And uh, Didi will tell a couple of more things about the four fields we actually look for uh, for some body. So, let's see. This one maybe. Just briefly. So, um, it's mainly about artists. In case you don't know it, just look it up on the internet. It's a blockchain system based on Ethereum. And uh, we want to do some changes on the, on the protocol itself. So that's the core part. For that, uh, ideally you know some Rust. If you don't know some Rust, you should know some C++, that helps. Um, then crypto is... Uh, well, we think crypto, if you have uh, good knowledge of basic of uh, basic cryptography, of uh, crypto libraries, um, especially of zero-knowledge zero proofs, um, that could be helpful. Mobile is a uh, classical uh, iOS and Android. Uh, we want to do a lot of... Uh, put a lot of focus on usability, and for usability, um, I think it's important to, to, to also uh, look at the details, and, and it, it's a lot of, about details, and the mobile is, uh, is today where, where it's easiest to interact with, uh, yeah, to, to, to get uh, users interacting. And web, uh, web is always needed. The apps on Ethereum are, are basically web applications with uh, the web tree library added. Um, we have uh, applications with uh, React. So we, we did a play for privacy project in, in October. That was a React application. And we prefer that stack. So if somebody knows React or even better React Native because that's maybe also something we use. So that's about the technology stack we are looking for. And uh, in the Lab 10 Collective, currently we don't uh, have employees in the classical sense, uh, but uh, we have members, they are basically shareholders, and uh, these members can uh, they, they know the, the projects the Lab 10 Collective is doing, and uh, so the members decide themselves what, what they want to work on. They need to be accepted by a project team, and that's how we work. And yeah, everybody interested, uh, the details, uh, which I was happy are um, there, the job offers, and you can talk to us. Thank you. So, good. Next thing about uh, who was, who is here first time? 
Blockchain Hub till a couple of years. So uh, Blockchain Hub France was uh, was founded uh, back in 2016, somewhere uh, in May. And uh, you have a couple of Blockchain Hubs out there. Uh, the original ones were in uh, in Berlin and in Brussels, and. Uh, and uh, it's all maturing forward. So currently we're in a kind of a definition stage uh, because uh, during the last two years, really a lot of things have uh, uh, have happened and it changed a lot in the whole scene. And you know, in, in Berlin you have like 50 meetups around blockchain, uh, and it's not like in Graz where you have basically one. Uh, so this is uh, this is really a, a booming area and. Uh, Basically, uh, we are we're still very happy that we have the blockchain hub. It's kind of a kind of a thing where where people can connect to, which are not really there yet, which have been kind of alerted by Bitcoin hype in December or in in in, in that time, uh, and now they are kind of looking around. And then uh, I'm still approached because we have uh, founded the blockchain hub. Um, it's basically a non-profit. Here in Graz it's not even an organization kind of thing, it's rather a network of people. Uh, I, I edit something, usually I, it was like translate blockchain to non-techies and now we have a tech talk this, to, this time, so basically also to non-techies. So we kind of, kind of separate tech talks and, and business talks. Um, make it maybe not too techy. I don't know. I, yeah, also techy. I know. I know that the most. It's always a kind of difficult thing. So, but we want to have the technical things a little bit more concentrated here to to say on the regular meetings. We talk really about more technical things, and then have separate meetups where we talk about more about business uh, related stuff. Um, we have currently 434 blockchainers in in uh, in the in the meetup. Uh, it's quite a big meetup compared to uh, all the others which are operating uh, in the rest of Austria. Um, so uh, so well, in Vienna, I, I regularly hear that basically Graz is well established in, in the blockchain space. So we are visible. Uh, if you talk to somebody in Vienna, then they uh, already know, okay, there is a vital or a, a, a good scene here in, in, in Graz. Um, if you're completely new uh, for, for blockchain, there, is, there was a, a project together with the Chamber of Commerce uh, where we described blockchain technology and, and, uh, and cryptocurrencies uh, and I hope it's still written in a way that it's still valid kind of one and a half years later. So it, it should be still valid. So it's for, for beginners uh, and it's becoming more and more difficult the more you read. It's like 60 pages uh, you can read about. So you just have to sign on that kind of Ubit uh, portal and then you basically read there. We have a YouTube channel so usually all these videos which are made are uh, brought to the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, also the slides, as soon as I get them, I upload to SlideShare and uh, so they can be reviewed afterwards. So you don't have to take pictures from the big slides uh, you would like to remember. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. So we're going uh, to Thomas' talk. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy that we have uh, Thomas here. He's actually working here in Graz. Um, and he was now a couple of months uh, in Hong Kong, uh, has a, uh, a little daughter, right? Yes, a little daughter. Yeah. So they got their, their daughter at home of, of his wife. So basically you have two citizenships uh, possibilities. So having uh, already the path for the daughter to choose either stay in Hong Kong or in, in Austria. Um, so, yeah. So Tom, uh, would you please introduce yourself a little? Uh, I can just say how we met. So we have we have a, a, a common friend. So he's working with Tom, and and he uh, told me that basically I should talk to him, and then I walked to uh, his company, and then we were sitting together, and then he was kind of already getting calls that some he should go home. Uh, and <laughs> so basically, we we talked a lot. We kind of 
uh, understand each other quite well, and now we stayed in kind of loose contact. And now that he's back, I'm happy that he's giving that talk uh, to us and give us more insight on Ethereum. Thank you very much. It's always been a pleasure being here. <laughs> Let me change laptops. Well, first of all, I was discussing with Thomas uh, how we're going to do this, either as a presentation mode or kind of a discussion style. And I remember once uh, one of my teachers uh, came to the classroom uh, lecture and started the lecture with, we're going to make this interactive. I talk and you listen. So <laughs> um, I, I try to avoid doing that. But with a presentation like this, uh, usually I talk. But if you find anything interesting uh, in the slides or any topic that I'm talking about, uh, you can interrupt me. It is not scripted. I'm not talking in the camera. So uh, uh, just any time, raise your hand. I don't know, make a noise. I'm going to stop and we're going to talk about what, is, what we're just talking about. Um, I also want to lend something from Mr. Antonopoulos, who is usually doing uh, talks on YouTube a lot. And he starts with a poll. So it's purely for statistics reasons to raise your hand if I ask something. I'm not going to bring you out here and you have to talk about it. And let's start with an easy question. Everybody knows about Bitcoin? Yeah? Ethereum? Yeah? Anybody bought something with Ethereum? Bought? Like goods, services and goods? Like transfer Ethereum <laughs> to buy something? <laughs> Yeah. Over here, I think everybody did that. Uh, everybody did smart contracts? Develop? Uh, use, use, use them? Or no, code them and deploy them. OK. I, I know. <laughs> That's unfair. <laughs> um, yeah, I, what I want to talk about today is uh, basically Ethereum smart contracts, what you can do with them, and what not. Uh, it's going to be a little bit technical, not too technical. And I think we're just going to start with the actual talk. I want to split this uh, because it's pretty long and I don't have like one hour to rant about solidity. Um, I'm going to split this in two things. The first part will be a little bit at a distance. Uh, Ethereum smart contracts, they're going to hy be hyped a lot. So uh, we hear about, we can use that to replace intermediaries. We can replace our legal system and so on. So I want to talk about this. Um, I also want to set the baseline first. So what is a smart contract? Why is it so cool? Why is it not cool? And so on. And then uh, gradually, I want to go a little bit more up close into the development sector. So what can we do and what we can't do before the talk and before finishing the slides, I found this uh, picture and I think, I think it's from 2015. I highlighted it here. Um, I'm not too sure, um, but I found it pretty matching. So we have all the services uh, that are building up on the middleware and on the infrastructure layer. And what I'm talking about today is a very, very tiny fraction of all of that. Uh, it's the smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, which is a public blockchain. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, hands up. Anybody know KeepKey? But Ledger Wallet? Okay. You know KeepKey? Yeah, yeah. Never heard of them. <laughs> um, a little bit about myself. So I started with uh, Solidity and Ethereum early 2016. I don't know the exact date. I just remember I had a friend of mine in America who is very deep in the uh, blockchain and crypto space. And he told me about this exciting new project, the DAO. Um, and the DAO at that time was just in the early development and it got hyped by uh, the press and media. And there were millions of dollars flowing into the DAO. And we had the wonderful idea, why don't we make a, a new smart contract where you can bet against the DAO? So the idea was, why don't we make a smart contract that is in gambling the number one use case for Ethereum, right? And unfortunately, before we could release that, uh, the DAO got hacked and our idea was pretty much vanished. Um, 
So I was standing there and uh, with my newly gained knowledge that I hard earned over a few weekends and was thinking, what can I do with that? And I found this other guy, uh, um, Upwork actually, who was doing trainings in Bitcoin. And he was looking for an, someone who can do trainings in Solidity and smart contracts. So this is how I got into this training thing. And we started to make video courses and other trainings and so on. And obviously, if you do trainings for a couple of hundred thousand students, uh, you get involved in some ICOs. I try to avoid being the advisor phase because I don't like that. Um, but I reviewed some white papers and also that knowledge is in this talk today. Now, I come from a background from, uh, from Solidity and Ethereum, like most of the people, I think, except Sherman, because Sherman has an academic background in that. I earned that by learning by doing. So I sit at home, code my smart contracts, and I see the result. Sometimes I read white papers, sometimes I read the yellow paper, but I do not have uh, any academic background in Ethereum. I do hold a master's, but that's a different story. So if I make any mistake or if I got something wrong, just tell me. I'm not biting. Let's start with the basic. What is a smart contract? Basically, it's logic represented in code that is executed by a computer. And that's something that we could do in any, any programming language. The difference to a smart contract is the performance is guaranteed and it's executed in a decentralized way where the nodes don't trust each other and everything is cryptographically secure and verified. You don't believe me? Okay, <laughs> wasn't sure. Um, so that's, that's basically what a smart contract is, right? It's just code that is running on some computers, they don't trust each other, and uh, it's running in a decentralized way. And that's, that's pretty cool, and uh, actually, initially, or right now, they are here to start a revolution, that's what we say. If you think of uh, insurances, if you think of um, terms between multiple parties, if you think of uh, value transfer, it's all here to, first of all, streamline the contracting process. We can do that very easily with templates. Uh, just deploy it, it's running on, this, on the blockchain, everything is fine, it's a trusted system. Uh, this is what we have, these uh, hyped keywords. Uh, we have reduced transaction costs. Um, if we eliminate banks, if we eliminate uh, parts of the financial system to transfer remittances, um, I think I read a study where uh, the, the central bank um, was actually forcing the banking system to reduce the transaction costs for remittances because it's so high. And with the blockchain, you know, it's just a transaction. We can simplify enforcement. Um, with the smart contract that is running on the blockchain, we can... <laughs> it's all right. I said, not scripted. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, we can make sure that uh, if the logic in the contract dictates that it's going to be executed at a certain time or when a certain event hits, it's, it's going to be like that. Uh, there's no way around. Computers don't change their mind and there's nobody who can tamper with that system. So that's pretty cool. That's all, all fine and nice and this is why the blockchain is a hype. In general, humans in business tend not to trust other humans. This is why we have uh, agreements, this is why we have courts, this is why we have a legal system. Uh, and if these humans are sitting in banks and governments, then usually we say, oh, the government is shit, or the government is dead, and we don't trust them, and the bank is so evil. And uh, we, we tend to believe that computers are the solution to that. They, they are trustworthy, they are not changing their mind, they are just running. Now, what are smart contracts used for at the moment? We have the typical agreements between multiple parties. And we can lock that up in a smart contract, we can deploy that, and we can make sure that this is going to be executed at the terms that are written in the smart contract. Uh, we can react to events, and that's a typical use case for insurances, and I'm going to give an example later of that. We can do value exchange. Uh, 
thinking of the CryptoKitties. I think maybe all of them have heard of CryptoKitties. Uh, real estate, uh, we, have the, we have the generic ERC20, ERC721 tokens, or we can just simply plain send ethers around, basically money. Uh, we have for the music industry, very interesting um, rights management, where you can get certain rights to certain music or artists and then use them for a certain period of time or uh, a certain multiple times you can listen to them and so on. And we have the typical settlement, which is also for insurances, very interesting payouts or payouts at a specific time to someone. Now, the first word is the word that we hear is trustless. And that's a uh, huge hype around the blockchain, a trustless system in the center. We don't need to trust it. I don't, I don't know if anybody of you had a friend or heard of someone who in the early days of eBay received a brick instead of a phone or received, I don't know, a couple of bottles instead of a new computer. Um, I had that. And uh, that's basically leading to e-commerce scams. And the internet itself wasn't really meant for uh, doing these deals with other people. And that led to uh, the rise of these intermediaries as Amazon and PayPal. PayPal with the buyer protection, uh, Amazon uh, with the marketplaces. And they are, they are here right now for a very, very good reason. Right? They protect the buyers and the sellers and, and arrange this uh, trusted, being the trusted intermediary. And we think with the blockchain, it's uh, trustless. You don't need them anymore. And that's basically the hype thing. The problem is that not everything that connects to a blockchain or runs on a blockchain or works with a blockchain is automatically trustless. And there's a lot of hype to the in, uh, investors and VCs. Uh, they're like, I'm having this new idea about an ICO, about this new uh, product is running on the blockchain and it's going to be trustless. We can eliminate any intermediaries. Now, if the contract code still is malicious and you cannot read it, it's still not trusted, right? It can still do bad things. Um, we have the problem of validation, and that's from a far distance, right? Um, if I'm writing with Thomas, uh, I want to have an agreement. And I hire you and say, like, uh, we have this agreement and we want to have this kind of uh, rental thing for this house and it has this and this much square meters and we have this on the weekends and blah, 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 blah. And you're going to write a smart contract. We can validate each and every transaction, but we still cannot validate a smart contract. And that's still a huge, actually a technical problem for people who are coming to the blockchain space and um, who are new, who cannot, who are not techies, who are not coming from the, from the development standpoint. And then the question arises, is the deployed smart contract that you wrote, is it really valid? Is it a valid representation of what we said, or is it not? And then we have the, the third part, this, yes. That's quite similar to a legal agreement. Yeah. It's a legal document basically has a similar character. Yeah. But uh, here's the problem. Self-enforcing and tamper-proof. Now we deployed the smart contract and it's running on the blockchain and we find out, well, uh, actually, it's not what we said. It's not our agreement, but the money is locked in there. And we cannot hire a court and say like, well, let's change it or let's overrule it. All not possible. So self-enforcing and tamper-proof, right? The code itself is unbiased and is objective. It just does. Uh, the Manipulation, yeah. Um, so you have, for example, uh, rent and loan payments that happen automatically, it gets deducted and so on. But what if the terms change a little bit? You cannot just update the code. It's basically what it said, immutable. You, once it's running there, it's running there. I know that there are update mechanisms right now in, in the early infancies, but um, right now, as it is, it's running, it's running. And 
cannot be tampered with, cannot change it. And then there's this statistics that says uh, in every single program that's running around the world, there is at least one bug. And I know that some people here know QMail and it's, it's not proven that there is a bug in there, but usually in every program there is a bug. And no matter how long you test it, if you have a tamper-proof system, a self-enforcing tamper-proof system with a bug, it will lead to some loss of money in the long run. <clears throat> and we've seen that, and I'll talk about this later as well. Question. Who knows what is the concept of efficient breach? If Thomas is asking me to buy my phone for $100, and I say, okay, let's do it tomorrow. And in the meantime, I meet Bill Gates on the road and he really needs a phone. And he says, give me your phone. I give you $10,000 for that. I think I'm gonna breach my agreement with Thomas and give Bill Gates my phone and just compensate him. If we're gonna make this agreement as a smart contract, I can never breach that. Efficient breach is something uh, from the economic side where you say you're gonna breach a contract intentionally because it's more efficient to compensate someone than not, not possible. And then, when we are talking about communication. Can, can you repeat this? It's not possible because you uh, sold it basically to Thomas, but then you gave it to. Yeah, but if the money, yeah, if the money, if you have a contract, a smart contract running on the blockchain, where the money is held in escrow and for whatever reason is something held in escrow, we cannot just, I cannot breach, breach it because it's, it's, it's locked in. It's like, yeah, this is maybe a bad example with real assets, but I think you get, you get the idea about the uh, efficient breach uh, can be with something else. Let's say tokens. Yeah, I have to compensate you in cash then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically it's, it's about this concept of the efficient breach. Uh, which is economically well established, I think, as far as I understand. No? Yeah. Um, and then when we are talking about uh, trustless, self-enforcing, tamper-proof systems, and we want to hire someone to do the programming, then you might know this, uh, this, this graphics. Uh, I think many of you know that. Um, so it's, I just read that. Uh, how the customer explained it, uh, uh, swing with three seats, how the project leader understood it, a swing with uh, one seat hitting against the tree, and how the analyst designed it. And there are many more pictures like that. If you have a communication between what the management wants and the developers want, and it's gonna end up differently than you really explained it to the finest detail, will not work the way you intended, and you can never really update it. So there are ways, but it's a challenge. Say it like this. Any questions? Let's come to the fun part. Five projects on Ethereum that are working today, and that they are released today, as far as I, I know. Um, Project number one is from a French airline AXA. It's an insurance. Uh, the pro product, I think, is called Fizzy AXA. So the idea behind this insurance uh, is a smart contract running on the Ethereum blockchain and paying you if your flight is more than two hours delayed between Paris and the US. So it's a kind of copy of Ethereum? Yeah. Oh, or I think they work together or they sold it to Physiaxa. <laughs> I, I remember them at the blockchain startup contest, but uh, that, I, I found it pretty um, tough for an airline to really deploy a smart contract that does that, but it seems to be working. Uh, the website is online, you can register, and as far as I understand, it's a huge savings for the airline because they have no claims, no administrative costs, it's just reacting to events, that's it. 
second project is uh, Slockit. And I think Slockit, as far as I understand, is a service where you can rent vehicles. So you can rent cars, but they have a different service where you can charge cars, electric cars, at their electric vehicle charging stations. And uh, it's basically a grid that they are building up, uh, electric vehicle charging staging grid. And uh, it's going to be paid automatically by a smart contract in Ether or in any tokens. So perfect use case, um, auto payments where the charging station itself knows how much to charge and is directly charging you via the blockchain. There is no intermediary needed, no central server, no central database. I think, in case you ask for corrections, right? yeah. um, I think uh, you have to refer to share and charge, uh, which is done in the uh, energy incubator. Ah. Uh, it's supported by Socket. As far as I know, it's not done by Socket. And it's, uh, oh. it's uh, allowing private charging stations uh, to be used for, uh, for others which use those private uh, charging sessions uh, to charge the electric car. Oh, okay. So I think Stockit is actually kind of supporting those because they're part of it. Um, or that was my impression. Uh, and that, that's the, the share and charge is the actual startup in the energy incubator. Uh, okay. Sure, they didn't bought it? No, I guess no, they, the market. Is a startup themselves. Okay. Uh, they, and then they have a really good marketing copy on their website. <laughs> Okay. Marketing is everything. Uh, then you might have heard of Ether, Ether Party. Um, templates is a, is a classic example. Right now you don't have to code anything. You don't need to, to know a lot about smart contracts and the intrinsics of different data types and whatnot. Um, you, you go to the website, you have audited, reviewed uh, smart contract templates where you can just choose whatever you want to use like a crowdfunding or a token or I think they have even insurances or agreements between different parties and you can deploy these smart contracts and let's say they are more secure than others but who knows. Then we have Propy. Uh, no? Okay. Uh, Real, uh, global real estate uh, trade is, is a pretty big problem. Uh, if you want to go ahead and buy today some, I don't know, property in Indonesia, uh, you have to know the local laws, you have to have an escrow service there, you have to have a notary, you have to have a bank, you have to have, I don't know, a lawyer there. And they want to simplify that. They still cannot completely get rid of doing the paperwork, but they found kind of a system where the money is held in escrow uh, until the paperwork is done and everything is uh, authorized by the authorities that the property is really signed over to your name and then they're gonna release the money. So that's kind of the idea to simplify global real estate trade. And then the last one uh, is invoice, fi invoice financing. Um, short invoice financing, what that is. Uh, if you have an open invoice and the, the, your buyer didn't give you the money and you know it's for, I don't know, 10,000 euros and you might think he's gonna pay in the next four months but he cannot pay right now, then you can go to Populous and they do invoice financing so you can sell someone your open invoice for a little bit less money. Uh, you get it paid immediately but a little bit less and he gonna collect the rest of the money once it gets paid. So that's invoice financing and that's also running on the blockchain. Typical example, what's working. Um, insurances, then charging stations, templates, uh, again value transfer and again value transfer. Let's talk about them in a little bit more detail. Right now, if you ever had a claim at an insurance, then you know it takes comparably forever. Uh, that can be health insurances or uh, home insurance. It's not because the insurance is so bad and they want to keep your money, it's because the administrative uh, cost and the administration for those claims, it's huge. And it also costs a lot of money for the insurance. 
there was this uh, study by Capgemini Consulting that said by putting the insurance claims process on the blockchain, you could save around 12.5% in costs. And that's a huge reduction of costs. I don't have the actual numbers, but it's, it's a lot. And a typical example for an insurance that could run on the blockchain would be an insurance that pays out during a natural catastrophic disaster. And the idea is that you put, you have all these IoT devices that collect data, and they are getting more and more and more. And you feed this data into a smart contract, and you have a threshold, and once a certain threshold is, is hit, the insurance pays out. <coughs> Exciting playing field for botnets. Yeah. In a, in a more generalized way, um, if somebody is interested, it could work like this. You have a contract, and you read the contract just like any other normal uh, insurance contract, just that this time it gets baked into a smart contract. Then you have the events. Uh, could be water hit the ceiling, and the smart contract gets executed and you immediately get your money. Simplified. Very simplified. Then I... So, who triggers the event? Do you need to be put down on the scene? It says, okay, now I'm uh, contact? Yeah. Um, so, there are, well, there are efforts to uh, verify IoT devices like sensors directly on the blockchain. So you would know that if an event from a sensor happened, that is a verified event from an IoT device and not just someone who comes and just pops in some, hey, the room is underwater, give me the money. So it would be basically a lot of different devices that you know that are trusted and you could feed that into a smart contract. But it's in its infancies at best, so it's very, 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 very early stage and very untested and not live. So it's just an idea. There's one for earthquakes, for example. And uh, it's pretty easy to see if there was an earthquake in that location. And they just don't check if your building is damaged. So basically it's like betting. You're betting if, if in your location there's an earthquake, mm -hmm. then you get paid. It doesn't matter if your building is damaged or not. Good example, yeah. I think I think it's easier if there is a public sensory network, yeah. like earthquakes. Uh, if you have your own sensor which tells the, the water hit the ceiling, well, then you, you might have, you might kind of help it a little to get the detection. So it's an yeah. additional floating iPhone or anything like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. the it's the same for these uh, flight insurance. Yeah? Yeah. For example, if you if you take the insurance, so you. You didn't even take the flight, you still get paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. You don't have a seat in the plane, but the plane is delayed and you get paid the insurance. Um, then I was recently watching this talk from Amber Baldet. She was working for JP Morgan on Quorum. Um, Quorum is a different blockchain than Ethereum. Um, and she was doing in this talk uh, a short and very concise comparison between uh, Quorum and Ethereum and why banks will not use Ethereum as their main blockchain. And she started with uh, just defining what is anonymity, privacy, and confidentiality. And I'm just going to define it here too. So anonymity comes from the Greek saying uh, without a name. So you are like swimming in the masses. You are not uh, identifiable. You are just someone. Privacy is like putting something you know in a box and lock it up, freedom from another unauthorized intrusion, and confidentiality is it is kept secret um, either with someone but nobody else, and um, it stays kept secret or private. She left JP Morgan. She left JP Morgan. Yeah, she's or she left. He has a bit of profiling, says unemployed, but he's yeah. working, she's working on the spot. Yeah, yeah. And she is, uh, she is an information bomb. When you hear her talking, she is like, da, 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 da. I would never argue with her. <coughs> um, 
So one, one thing that you made very clear, and I think um, even though we would love that banks use the Ethereum blockchain, banks will always have a centralized database. Uh, no matter what will come, they love the centralized database, and it's good because it's so easy to manage. Easy to manage. Um, and, but it's, it's kept in their basement or wherever. Um, it's in their hands. But banks are starting now to realize that it's a good idea to share certain information with other banks via blockchain. And uh, this is, I, I think, if I understood the talk right, where Quorum comes in. Uh, you have this idea that you can share in a mutualized financial infrastructure information with other banks. And while you keep certain information private at the bank uh, database, you can share other information with the banks. But in a public blockchain like Ethereum, you have all the state mutations and they're all public. And that's a huge challenge for banks because they love their privacy and they love their confidentiality. And if you can track everything down, then they will not go for it. And that's where uh, Quorum comes in and where you have the private smart contracts and where Ethereum just cannot deliver what they want because it's all public. So what is Ethereum then actually used for? What are public blockchains useful for? One obvious reason uh, why we want to use a public blockchain where everything is public and you cannot tamper with it and you cannot change it, it's censorship resistance. Once it's there, uh, you can change it and the government can also not go ahead and just change it and they cannot censor it because it's published, it's published. They would have to have right now 50 over 50% 50 of the miners. Uh, in future versions of Ethereum, it's not even possible, I think. Somebody might want to correct me, but with uh, proof of stake, it's going to be pretty hard to tamper with anything. You have the P2P value transfer. A uh, huge thing, uh, the most hyped thing on the Ethereum blockchain is you can simply just transfer tokens, uh, crypto kitties, anything that, any assets, you can just transfer them, including Ether, obviously. Banks share certain information on the Ethereum network, and that's a very small limited amount of information, but uh, for public bank records, it's an ideal place to share them. Uh, and banks use that partly. Um, but it's usually, uh, as far as I understand, always with the consent of the user. Um, and it's always the part of the records that are really public. Then you have identity attestations, credit attestations that can be made on Ethereum. And you have the IoT code verifications for IoT devices. Uh, huge thing. If we look at successful projects and unsuccessful projects, then the successful projects share a few parts. Uh, it doesn't mean that doing everything here will make your project a success, but doing nothing of that will pretty much make sure that your project will be unsuccessful. And I've seen some of the parts here, um, and I want to talk about each and every one of them. So um, the one thing, People come, write a smart contract, very hard to read, almost unable to audit it, and put it on the blockchain. It's a very good idea. You cannot read the smart contract, you don't understand the logic. It's amazing how, how many people are doing that. Other companies come and say like, hey, blockchain, ah, really good topic. Uh, everybody hype this topic right now. We're gonna make a lot of money. Let's put all of our infrastructure that we have right now on the blockchain. Very good idea. You're gonna blow it up, I tell you. Rule of thumb is only put those parts on the blockchain that really benefit from the blockchain and nothing else. And that's uh, what most of the successful projects have in common. Easy to read code, easy to audit code, easy to test code, very small, small parts only on the blockchain that really make use of the blockchain and nothing else. And then there is uh, this whole huge amount of projects that want just to ride the wave quick money, let's make an ICO, let's make a quick project, uh, and they're not doing organic growth. If you have a cool project uh, that is making use of the blockchain, you can grow organically. Uh, you will have a community behind you. People will love your project and they will support you, uh, no matter what, you don't have to ride the wave.
So now it's getting a little bit more technical. Um, five things that you can't really do right now. And by reading that, some of you will already say, now this is wrong. And I just read them out now, and I'm going to talk about this in a second. One, contacting external services. You cannot right now really in a secure way contact external services. <clears throat> you cannot enforce on-chain payments. Uh, you cannot force someone to pay you on the blockchain or keep the money there. You cannot hide confidential data. Everything that's on the Ethereum blockchain is public. And that's a huge thing that many people misunderstand. If you do an ICO, you have to cover all bases. You have to avoid stupid hacking mistakes, as other ICOs did that. Um, not just because your crowdfunding contract is running on, this, on the Ethereum blockchain, means that your website is secure. And last, you have to avoid human programming errors. If you have code, you're going to test it. You're not just taking your half-baked code and put it on the blockchain. And the best example is actually the DAO. Um, I don't know if anybody of you know this picture. Uh, we have Ethereum here. We have the DAO. And we have Bitcoin watching. And Ethereum says, look how much I have. And the DAO says, can I hold it? And bam, it's burned. Security and human, uh, human programming errors. I think it's a, uh, yeah. And it was pretty much like this. And with the parity bug and with the ERC20 overflow bug, it's nothing else. Contacting outside services. Um, a smart contract is running in a sandbox. So if the smart contract gets executed by a miner, it's running in a sandbox. It cannot escape there. It has to have either data coming in uh, on an event basis, or there is a solution that's called oracles. And oracles are so-called trusted external services. And the problem with trusted external services is you are escaping this secure sandbox, and you are getting information back, for example, from an HTTP request. You do an HTTP request to get a weather API. But it's not 100% trusted anymore. And in my opinion, it's completely untrusted. Uh, no matter what you're going to say, um, you cannot ensure just because you are connecting to an oracle, which is, again, a centralized service, um, that the data that is delivered from the oracle is secure. So you're basically escaping this secure, tamper-proof sandbox in order to get information from somewhere else. Bad idea. Who is uh, executing this uh, getting information from Arachne? It's only one node or multiple nodes? Because if multiple nodes are checking the information from the Arachne, it's more secure. Uh, it doesn't matter because it's the other way around. Oracles write it into the blockchain. Yeah. And you will basically have to trust the Oracle. I mean, there's, there can be some cryptographic validation of, of what the Oracle puts, but there's only some part you need to trust in this model. So it's basically you connect to actually, you could connect to a, a server, um, which is, uh, what do we have? Uh, a, a weather API. Let's say you want to, you, you have a gambling contract and you pay out if there's rain. So you have to escape this sandbox of the smart contract and you have to connect to this Oracle and that Oracle connects to the weather API, to the server, and then gets the data and then sends a new transaction back to your smart contract. Now, the problem is the last part here between the Oracle and the Weather API, uh, because this is something, well, the information that it gets is maybe, again, validated, um, validatable, and, and has a signature. But you cannot 100% make sure that the Weather API didn't send you bogus data or got hacked or whatever. I actually have a question on that. Yeah. Um, as far as I understand, uh, services like, for instance, Chainlink and Oracle, uh, what they basically do is uh, you ask of them uh, some uh, data from an API, like, like hitting a web endpoint, yeah. and then what they do is basically send a transaction back with the API data in the additional data? Yes. And that, I assume, is treated like a normal transaction, so with the associated costs. Yes. Like Okay. Yes. Plus, you get you get uh, additional information uh, to verify that it's really coming from Oracle or from oh, the other. 
but you cannot really verify the data itself. It's like you have to treat it like user input. Mm -hmm. Hiding confidential data. Uh, in the beginning, and now it's slowly coming down, people thought that a private variable in a smart contract is private and you can never ever read the content. A private variable is not hidden. Uh, you cannot access it in a programmatic way, but every half decent programmer can go in there and tell me every private variable from a smart contract uh, because all the data on the Ethereum blockchain is public and you can look at it from any block explorer and see what is in there, what kind of data is stored. And that's a huge thing. Uh, so we have some layers uh, on top which are starting, but uh, you would need encryption on top of what we have already. And um, also if you have any game like... Um <laughs> <laughs> Don't get it distracted. It's okay. Uh, if you have a game like Battleships, right, where you have to kind of know the other person, then you have solutions to that, what is called hash commit reveal, for example. So you just commit a hash, and then at the end of the game, you reveal the hash with what it was encrypted, and everybody can verify that it was really on A3 and not on set 7. But it's not encryption. So as far as I understand, it's still a matter of research. Um, I, I lost track a little bit with CK snarks on Ethereum, but I think it's also not there yet. Enforcing on-chain transactions. Uh, and the smart bonds are a huge, huge topic on Ethereum. This is mainly the, the number one example when you hear someone like, what are we gonna do with Ethereum? Uh, let's make smart bonds. What are bonds? If you have a cool uh, project, but it's pretty risky, um, and I take Thomas again, I tell him, Thomas, I need uh, 10,000 euros for a cool project, and I'm gonna pay you back in five years to 10,000, and every year I pay you 1,000 euro. That would be a bond. It has a face value, it has an interest rate, and it has an expiry date, and it's perfectly fine to make all of this on the blockchain. I'm telling him, let's make this a smart contract and you just give me uh, 10 Ether and uh, the rest uh, will be paid with the smart contract, he will pay you back. Now, he pays the 10 Ether and I'm definitely gonna leave that in the smart contract because I don't need that money. No, I will take it out and the smart contract is empty. So basically, you have an empty smart contract that tells you in a certain time it's gonna pay you back, but if there's no money inside, it's pretty bad. So uh, you cannot enforce on-chain transactions. And you've seen it with a lot of ICOs. The people think, I'm gonna invest in that, anyway it's gonna be secure, it's running on the blockchain. And what are the people doing with the ICO money? They are changing it and then running away. Easiest thing, right? A massive topic of research is uh, randomness on the blockchain. One uh, major rookie mistake is to use the uh, block timestamp, which can be uh, influenced by the miners. Um, and in general, deterministic systems like uh, a blockchain is not really good with randomness. There are some solutions. Again, one is with an oracle where you can contact an external service and you get a random number back. Uh, but in general, randomness is a problem. Um, not only on the blockchain. I think uh, Cloudflare is doing randomness with lava lamps. Uh, I've seen a really cool video. Um, and on the blockchain, you can do it with a smart contract, a Randau smart contract, where all the participants are coming together in one way. I didn't really read the code. Uh, but at the end, a random number is generated. But still, huge topic of research. If you want to write a PhD, go for randomness on the blockchain. And then we have, uh, because Ethereum is pretty in the infancies, we have an immature ecosystem. Um, that starts with, if you're gonna start uh, a Java program today, you're gonna start with a standard library. You have that. You have uh, audited code, you have uh, frameworks to work with. You have a lot of already written code that you can reuse. 
It's starting slowly with Open Zeppelin, where they provide you audited code and templates and so on. Uh, problem again with audited code, if you change audited code, it becomes unaudited. Um, but there are no real standard libraries and there are no real templates yet. So it's pretty early stage. Solidity uh, is in the version 0.4.23-ish, um, constantly changing. So I think some of the smart contracts in the Ethereum wiki are still using 0.3, which you can't run anymore. Um, the language itself is changing so fast that a lot of the templates, a lot of the tutorials, if you start now with Ethereum development, you will hit a very quick point where nothing is working because uh, the people are not updating the code all the time. Uh, and slowly, 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 uh, workflows are emerging. And if you want to start any big project right now, you probably start with Truffle and maybe with Drizzle and you're going to use Ganache to test it on your local in-memory blockchain and so on. And we have the standards that are emerging out of ERCs and uh, Ethereum improvement proposals that are working constantly on the Ethereum blockchain. But it's all very, very immature for my understanding and maybe coming more from, you know, if you're coming more from enterprise development and then you come to the blockchain space where uh, a few people are sitting together, it's very slow. Very fast on the one hand, but very slow coming to what we think actually development should be. Then obviously because you have the value and the code on the same system, every single bug costs real money and a lot of that. Um, it started with the DAO, which was the re-entrancy bug, which we have now with the checks effects interactions pattern. We know it all, uh, we avoid it, and Solidity is working hard on uh, making it harder for people to produce code that allows that, but it's still in there. We have the parity bug, which costs roughly 280 million US dollars. Uh, parity itself is audited code, reviewed, audited, but they're using an unaudited library, and in the library there was a bug. <laughs> the bug, any bug, costs money. Actually, for me, it was even more interesting because the library itself, the contract itself was also audited, it was from the foundation, but Barrett converted it into a library contract, and that introduced the bug. Oh, okay, I was reading it differently. I was reading the never audited the, the library so, code. You mean the last one, the multi yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't re audit the final one, but it was just a, basically a refactoring of an audited contract. Oh, okay. Yeah. Too bad. And the last one is the ERC20 overflow. Um, if, you, if you have an unsigned integer, I don't know how many people of you know what is an unsigned integer, but if you subtract one from an unsigned integer, you wouldn't really expect to have the maximum integer suddenly without any warning or anything. So um, I'm not really blaming Solidity. Uh, I'm not really blaming the developer for that. I'm blaming Solidity for that. I would expect from a language to actually throw me a warning at least if I do stupid things. But it's so early that, and they, I mean the Solidity uh, developers admit it, it's too early. It was never meant as a mainstream adoption suddenly. Um, but yeah, here we go. ERC20 overflow, just last week. I don't know how much it cost. Do you know how much it cost? Mm -hmm. Probably a lot. Um, sorry, just to understand. So you mean you subtract one from zero? Yes. And then you get a Yes. But that's common practice in C++. Is it? Yes. Without any? I am not a C++ programmer. Right, C++, but that's yeah, a language support. I mean, you kind of use this on programs. Yeah, you do <laughs> But in a, in a security, I um, mean, in a... No, I'm just saying. I was just wondering. Well, it's one of the unsigned integer or unsigned integer? Unsigned, unsigned integer. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. I, I've done C++ the last time, 12 years ago, at university. But I mean, you're right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially in a, uh, in a security conscious language that 
is actually focusing, um, making it hard to make mistakes. Um, these mistakes can happen uh, a lot. But they are having a lot of um, compiler warnings. Uh, yeah, which is good. Maybe they will also soon cover that. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I'm waiting for a lot more. I think they have now the uh, exceptions which, where you can actually return something. You can still not catch them, but you can return something. And, yeah. I mean, solidity is not alone that uh, strings are problematic, but if I offer strings, I would at least love to compare them in one way or another. And uh, you have the integers uh, wrap around by default, doesn't throw you an exception. I don't know, uh, in other languages. The languages I know this pretty hard to do that. Um, operators have a different semantics um, and the integers are just truncated and this also, at least the last time I looked, it doesn't throw you any error or any warning or anything. It's just gonna be managed. Um, copy by reference, copy by value uh, depends implicitly on the variable location if it's memory or storage. And you have these helpers, 10 seconds, 100 ether which you can use, but it's not bound to anything. You can do 10 seconds plus 100 ether and it's perfectly valid. So you just see where solidity is coming from. It's early. Not bad. Uh, yeah. And then uh, this is the last slide. You have the other problems and that's platform problems uh, that are probably solved in the near or long term future but they are still there. You have the gas um, and the transaction fees, which are high if there's a network congestion. I've, I think I've heard about a miner who did like $7,000 with one transaction during an ICO. And that's just crazy thinking of, you just pay nothing if there's no congestion and you pay a lot if there's um, a little bit of traffic on the blockchain. And you said it's a limitation, right? Hopefully they solve it. Uh, you have the immature tools and the constant flux of the ecosystem. I do the recordings for the course, and once I'm finished, I have already the first student telling me something is not working because it changed. And that's, we're talking about weeks, maybe days sometimes. Um, you have immutability, which is awesome uh, if there was no possibility for a hard fork. Uh, again, if you do a hard fork, or if you do change it afterwards, not necessarily a hard fork, but if you can change it afterwards with the agreement of all the nodes, it's useless. Um, you don't have immutability suddenly anymore. And then you have the bugs uh, that are coming because there are no static analyzers, there are no audits, no real audits yet. There are some, but not a lot. And then you have the scaling issues, which we are hopefully seeing to be solved with uh, the next Ethereum releases. You are released. <laughs> That's it. Uh, that was the whole part. At the end, uh, you find the references in case somebody wanted. And I'm going to put the slides, uh, give it to Thomas. So if you find it useful, download it. I hope you liked it. I hope you learned something. Please don't be shy. You I mean, Thomas is maybe hiding again in Hong Kong, so uh, so it might be you can't ask him uh, valuable questions. So please go ahead. Um, in your courses, what's your impression? What's uh, most difficult for those learning? Um, we are usually starting with. with what I'm trying to do is finding the workflow, uh, starting to develop an in-memory blockchain, then a private net, and then connecting to a test net and then to the main net. And what people are most struggling with is not solidity. It's very easy. You can start hacking with solidity. It's very easy to learn, and I think this is why it got so much adoption. Uh, Truffle is relatively easy now to get started with. What is hard still is to uh, make people understand that a private blockchain is not the same as the testnet, is not the same as the mainnet, and the data is not interchangeable there. You can deploy it on the private net, you can deploy it on the testnet, and then on the mainnet, but it's not a migration from your private net to the, to the testnet. You have to redeploy it there. So this understanding that 
uh, the system internally works exactly the same. Uh, you can use the exact same private keys. Um, you can do the exact same transactions. But the networks change, and how you configure them, I think that's the, the most questions I get. Like, how do I, how do I configure my testnet now? It's not the testnet, it's the private net. Uh, how do I migrate from the testnet to the mainnet? You have to redeploy. Why is that? Why cannot I? I have already users. Uh, can I not just copy that? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the main point of it, but it's directed to beginners. So the courses are directed to uh, blockchain beginners. Now, the transaction costs. Is it now cheaper or more expensive than traditional finance bank fees? Um, that depends. Um, is it predictable? Is it, it is relatively predictable. If you're not just hitting uh, a huge congestion period for uh, whatever reason, because there is an ICO by, by accident. Uh, you can go very low, in, with very low costs. And you can transfer a lot of money with very low costs. But, but it's predictable only in the sh pretty short term. Yeah. You cannot predict what happens tomorrow. No, no. You can predict it for the next few transactions. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, right now there is no congestion. I just send out my transaction with, I don't know, two way or one way per class. But um, if you have, if you work with smart contracts, that need a lot of gas, um, and maybe even go to the, to the gas limit of 6 million gas, and there's a lot of congestion, it becomes extremely expensive. Uh, Where is the current limit? I think it's 6 million, I think. The last time I looked, it was 6 million. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, I mean, you can do a little bit. It's a, it's a problem if you want to do anything complex as a developer. You are limited uh, computationally. But um, if you just want to do transactions, you can go very low. It's a lot of gas emits a lot of computer power. Ah, yeah. So um, every yeah, every um, the concept of gas is to detach um, the operation of the smart contracts economically from uh, ether. So normally you would say I pay one ether for running the smart contract. But now you pay for every single operation that you do. Um, let's say you have a um, variable assignment. You assign a variable the value 1. And this costs some gas. So now you can go ahead as the person who executes this. I want to pay so and so much ether for so and so much gas. So you can. Uh, you can vary the, the amount that you pay for the transaction uh, in total. And that means that other person can bid higher or lower, um, and that depends on how fast the transaction is mined. So it's kind of a, they try to avoid saying you always pay 0.1 ether for executing the smart contract. No, you always pay 3 million ether to execute this contract, and you choose yourself how much ether that's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And the more congestion is on the network, the higher the cost will be. That's a pure economics reason. Who is executing this smart contract? Is it the node who is finding the block? Basically, executing the smart contracts are all nodes. But the only node that gets the block reward is the mining block, uh, the, the mining node. So there's one. one. But one is creating the block, including the results of this smart contracts, and all the verified. Yes. Okay. And is that all miners or all full nodes that execute the smart contract? It's all full nodes. So it's, yeah, basically, even if yeah. you're not really going yeah. for the reward, yeah. you because still execute that. The nodes itself don't trust each other, mm -hmm. uh, so that's by default, and they have to verify the result. So there's no cheating on the network. Mm -hmm. So this means basically it's random who is executing it because you don't know who is finding the next block. It's and this is some kind of security if you're asking or or asking and so yeah. on, you cannot fake the DNS, DNS this node is using and so yeah. because you don't know which node is finding the block and executing the contract. Yeah. So basically more or less it should be random um, with huge minor 
networks and hashing. I mean, the more hashing power you have, the less random it will be. <laughs> well, actually, uh, I found an article which tells basically that Ethereum is less decentralized than Bitcoin yeah. because it has even more concentration on uh, on mining uh, mining. Loads. Less than twenty pools. Hardware. Yeah, less than twenty. So it's like I think Bitcoin is like uh, mining pools having like. 20 or something, and if you is even kind of more concentrated on mining pools. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, this is kind of unrelated, but like it's outside of the technicality of smart contracts. But one of the, I'm working on a project that is about mm, finding ways to use uh, blockchain technology in general for DLPs in general, for uh, humanitarian aid and development. And one of the things that I find uh, quite difficult is actually sort of finding the best ways to um, educate people on what is a good use of the smart contracts in the first place and uh, of uh, blockchain in, uh, in general. How do you generally uh, do it, basically? So how do you educate people on this is technically feasible using smart contracts, but you might not really get the benefits as opposed to, for instance, a centralized database or a federated database. That's why I said it's kind of outside, because it's more of a... <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have a blueprint for that, but I would start with uh, showing some examples, calculating through, I don't know, uh, writing down the benefits versus the pros and cons. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and then going in and depending what I want, I either pitch it and highlight the benefits or uh, just be that honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main point of pitching, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, sure okay, there are some, some drawbacks, but these are the benefits. Um, uh, or just be that honest and say like, well, you guys have this problem and that's the solution, but it might have some drawbacks there. Um, actually, um, too bad that uh, you're talking about this uh, humanitarian, humanitarian uh, blockchains because I remember there were some humanitarian projects during the blockchain startup contest and I didn't find them anymore today. And I wanted to give them as an example, but Okay. Like, the, the one with earthquakes is help a bit. Yeah, now there were some that are distributing money to, uh, I think, war areas or, or disaster areas. But there not, are some yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, it's also, also yeah. help a bit. Yeah. So basically, they're doing the earthquake stuff as well as this kind of yeah. distributing money of, uh, well, in the case of Bitcoin, basically getting the money to those kind of uh, disaster hit yeah. areas. Yeah. Uh, on LinkedIn, if you have a lot of connections in the blockchain space, there yeah, you, you see a lot of times some kind of flow chart where you go through, and uh, there's a lot of you don't need a blockchain. Yeah, I think this is yeah. this is a good example for smart contracts also because if if I go through this flow chart and the result is I don't need the blockchain, public blockchain, then I. You don't need the smart contracts on the public blockchain also. So basically, whenever there are people involved, there are various no trust problem and so on. You don't need a blockchain, you don't need smart contracts and so on. Yeah, I think that was the kind of misconception regarding the banks. You know, they formed all these kind of big kind of consortia where they all joined together and then, uh, then basically came to a point that kind of they made something like quarrel. Yeah. Uh, and and forum is kind of more putting a kind of need for, for uh, hiding the data, which is uh, which is transferring. You know, not a third. Well, two banks even don't want to have a third bank within their network to know what kind of transaction they are doing. Yeah. Uh, and and if you can't hide that properly, uh, then of course uh, the public or even a private Ethereum network would just not be feasible for that kind of business transactions. Because that's one of the one of the problems that I found the most is like I come from only an analysis perspective, I'm not pitching anybody, but the amount of sort of blockchain is in there because it's cool at the moment is kind of worrying, uh, yeah. especially through um, identity projects. 
And I actually have an unrelated question, but this is on technical uh, <laughs> on the technical side. Mm -hmm. I've been reading up on uh, processes to upgrade smart contracts, and there's a bunch of work from the people behind um, Aragon and uh, and uh, Open yeah. um, Do you do you think that there will be a method, like an officially sanctioned method, uh, quote unquote, to actually um, upgrade? So, like Apple, for instance, for uh, using references to smart contracts and having a central like um, smart contract that hosts the client uh, information and then you reference it through others? Or do you think it will be more like a everybody will find their own solution and uh, will basically continue as we are with uh, five different ways to do it? Not uh, okay, first of all, I hope that not everybody will find their own solution. Um, and I hope there will be some standardized way of upgrading. But I don't think there will be a one-fits-all solution. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think it's possible because I was writing a prototype on upgrading smart contracts and I know the proxy solution from Open Zeppelin and, and a couple of others. And they're all fine and good, but they are not applicable for all business uh, uh, use cases. So, um, I, I mean, personally, what most of the people are making the mistake is they forget that there is money involved and they don't manage the money at risk. So if you, have, if you find a bug, you have to have some kind of an upgrade path, some kind of a method to pause a smart contract, some kind of a method to inform your users, some, something. Uh, but as you said, most people are just putting their smart contracts out there. They do not have any upgrade mechanism. They do not have any pausing mechanism. They do not have any stopping mechanism. They do not have anything. It's just if there is a bug or if there is any, any doesn't even necessarily be a bug. It can be a feature upgrade that's necessary um, or they want to change something. They are starting at a point where you would say, actually, where you start uh, with your smart contract, you should do this during the testing phase or during the prototyping, not on the live chain, please. And, and so there will be, I think, there will be some upgrading mechanisms emerging, and that's a good thing. And they will all have different upgrades, upsides and downsides. So I think one year from now, we, when we start a new blockchain project, we will start with templates, uh, templates in a business sense. So we want to go this direction. Okay, there is uh, this development environment, this framework, these libraries, uh, these smart contract templates that you want to use, and they have this feature, that feature. Upgradability is one of them, and there is this proxy contracts, or you want to do that smart contract. Uh, they cannot do uh, upgrades from the whole system because they need to have that baked in the blockchain, but they can do upgrades of some small parts. So maybe I think it, it, it's emerging, let's say it like this, and I hope there will be some standards and especially some known standards that are defined that come out as uh, we know that it's working and we have it battle tested. Um, yeah, so. Basically, I hope that people will not just do their own stuff somehow. <laughs> but I hope that we get, we get a chance to have some kind of upgradability at some point. Um, not everything, because it changes the whole idea, but some, some parts, yeah. So one more question, and then basically going to kind of talk to you directly. Um, you just kind of, you explain these flaws and maybe the insecurity of the tools uh, in the garage attitude of developers sometimes. It, uh, and you said already there will be maybe some standards. Maybe might be there will also be a stack, uh, certification yeah. for, for a normal user which is not inclined in all these technical technical details. Yeah. How can he see that something is really done in a proper way? Hmm. <laughs> How can you see if it's done in a proper way? Not the garage software with uh, no pause mechanism, no update mechanism, with no base of a real system. Or real, real system. Yeah, you have to trust the audits, I think. Yeah. Or wait for a year and see if something goes wrong. The thing is, um, 
why do people uh, hire Microsoft consultants to manage their infrastructure with Microsoft products versus some freelancer who comes from university costs a fraction of that and just deploys some Linux systems. I think it all comes down to liability. If the Microsoft guy and if there's a bug in a Microsoft system, then Microsoft is liable for that and they're gonna pay. And if you have the little freelancer and you go bankrupt, you cannot really sue him. I mean, you can, but you will not get any money. So I think it will come down to um, people with money coming in and starting to offer auditing services and starting to uh, take the risk that a smart contract is doing what it says. And if it doesn't, they're gonna pay it from maybe their pocket money, but um, you're safe, they're safe, they get some money, you get some money, everybody's happy. But to be honest, it's I, too to I me think. that Microsoft pays for bugs. My perception is more that it's about, yeah. well, I know this brand, I trust it because others trust it too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they cannot pay for bugs because their system is so secure. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think no. that's kind of a nice finishing, actually. <laughs> so Microsoft is the most secure system out there. We have that on video. <laughs> you don't want to mess with the big guys. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, I, I really would like to say uh, thank you for, for the talk. I mean, uh, you can stay as long as you like. So usually it's, it's kind of past 12 um, and ask further questions, uh, get more into details, uh, get to find out more about smart contracts, uh, watch his videos, uh, all these kind of things. So basically, I uh, hope you have a nice evening and nice chat. And thank you again, Thomas, for your talk. Thank you.